Welcome back to Kettlebells and Cocktails. I'm your host, John, back with Nikki and a very special guest this week, Don Fall. Don, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Hanging in there, beat up. I've been training for the open and um, I don't make good decisions. So, I'm, <laughs> well, you're in the right community. <laughs> I, was I, feel about, you. I was thinking about that today. I, I, I spent a lot of time preaching to people my age of how to take care of themselves. And then yesterday I did a lot of really dumb stuff in the gym. I'm like, man, my shoulders really hurt today. It was just not smart. But you're going to do what you need to do to recover properly. Right, John? Right, John? Of course. <laughs> of duh. Don't, don't we all? Don't we all? Totally. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, hey, listen, Don, I appreciate you joining. I was actually, I was thinking today how much I appreciate the fact you do this, not just for us, but I've seen you yeah. on multiple shows you know, really over the last six months. And it's really impressive how accessible you are to the community. So thanks for joining. Seriously. Well, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me on. I always get something out of these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. We had the, um, I'll kind of update the listeners, kind of the impetus to bring you on this. We had a guest on several episodes, Frank from CF Perfect affiliate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when it was over, Nikki and I, like, we could always kind of decompress these conversations and try to determine, you know, how did it go? How do we feel about it? And we felt fine about the episode, but we also felt like out of a sense of fairness, it'd be nice to bring you on and talk about some of the great work that CrossFit's doing. I, I think uh, this is a little, kind of a backhanded compliment to some degree. I think you guys have been doing a lot of really great work lately and not getting enough credit for it, whether that's, you know, by design or your fault or what, I don't know, but probably a little bit of both. No, not by design, I would say. Well, potentially by the internet's design as a hot garbage fire all the time. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah, maybe. I, you know, when we had that conversation, you know, I think the, the biggest thing that came out of it was kind of this narrative that private equity, in this case, Berkshire, only cares about profits. And I, I work for a major corporation, so I didn't personally believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the relationship with private equity and just maybe have you expand on you know, the relationship Berkshire has with CrossFit, you know, in regards to them being a, you know, really kind of a financial management company and how that applies to this business and, and in an effort to get it to grow. I would, I would love to talk. That'd be awesome. I do think that most of our listenership who doesn't work in banking or own their own business or or manage large corporations probably doesn't understand a lot of the hierarchy and structure when it comes to corporations and who's pulling the strings and who has, you know, the cash flow and and all that. So that sort of just just being really clear about who influences what, where and why, I think is also going to help us understand exactly the influence that those partners have in a corporation like CrossFit. Could not agree more. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Well, maybe we just start with your role as CEO. I, you know, I, I'd like yeah. to hear, you know, like kind of what are your obligations both to, you know, the, the, the stakeholders like affiliate owners like myself. And then, yeah. you know, obviously you have an obligation to the board and to Berkshire to grow the business. So how, how are you balancing that out? This might have been the first question that we asked Don the last time he was on our show too, right well, after you got into the position. We might have been like, what do you, <laughs> what do, you do? Yeah. Like, what's let's, your, let's hope I, I don't give a wildly different answer if I do a <laughs> much better one than last time. Just in case Berkshire is watching, right? Um, I'd start with, I, I think there are, you know, I think for any business, you've got what we call them constituents, stakeholders, shareholders, like you can articulate it in different ways. What I would say, they are people and entities who I and we are, are accountable. And so, you know, for us, for me, I'm accountable first and foremost. And, and, you know, as an area, I would also tell Berkshire, the community is first and foremost. Like it is our existing community. And I would also say it's what I hope our future we will be. I think, look, we know this is an incredibly mission driven community. Most of the folks who work in this community are, are doing it because they've seen the impact CrossFit has in people's lives and they want to extend that to more people and feel not like feel a degree of an obligation to that, given how big the problem that, that we can solve it is in the world and is in our community. So. First and foremost, I'm accountable to our community. Uh, I'm accountable to our affiliate owners, to our coaches, to members. The second group is I'm accountable to our team. You know, I always talk about this like inverted notion of leadership. Like I'm, I learned early and I'm a big believer in 
in servant leadership. And it's not that our employees work for me. It's, it's the exact opposite. And it's my job to make sure that I'm doing the best job that I can in creating the conditions where our team can have the biggest potential impact in a way that's fulfilling and rewarding for that. We also have, obviously, like, because our employees are also so mission driven, I want them to, to, I want work for them to satisfy a career, but also their soul and their heart. I want HQ to be a place they're incredibly proud of and the impact that we have. And I, you know, we take that super seriously. And then the third piece is I'm accountable to our investors. And so, you know, we are majority owned by Berkshire Partners. They're a private equity firm. They have investors. So they go out and they raise money and they make investments with that money. They're majority owners. So they mo own more than 50% of the company. We then have another set of investors who own part of the company as well. So that's a mix of some of that is employees. So part of our compensation package, we give stock to our employees. Some of that is other individual investors who have been a part. And so we're accountable from a fiduciary perspective. So actually accountable legally to making sure we're making the best possible decisions in service of our shareholders. Now, you know, that really governs, you know, the way that I think about my responsibility, our job. And so that is articulating both, I would say two things. One part of our job is articulating a plan. So, you know, the board and our company and the community, I think should hold us accountable for communicating where the heck are we going? What does success look like? How are you guys going to deploy your resources and your mind share in service of helping CrossFit? At the board level, that has to translate to a financial plan. We're running a business. And so our investors expect an, a, a return. And part of our job is being able to, to, to kind of realize this vision for the community and impacting more lives. And along the way, making sure that we're being great fiscal stewards of the business and the resources that we have access to. How often do these silos of the business interact with one another? Or I guess a, a better question is, you sort of said it's it's your job as the, as the middleman here, really, to make sure that everyone is understanding of a, a true high-level direction. And that oftentimes will involve, I'm assuming, uh, conflicting interests among all three of those silos of groups that you kind of are beholden to. So I'm just curious to know from your perspective, like how often are you relaying to the community, hey, I know you guys want this, but, you know, Berkshire needs its cash or like, hey, Berkshire, I know you, you know, you need these dollar bills, but like we got to do this thing for the community first. And how sort of how fluid are they in yeah. understanding the greater the greater ecosystem that they're all a part of? Yeah, I'll be honest. Like when I came into this job, I knew obviously I knew I did a little bit of homework. Yeah. I knew that CrossFit was private equity owned. I knew it had mm -hmm. financial investors. And the biggest question I wanted to know coming in. So for, when I took this job, for me, what I derived the most satisfaction out of is, you know, whatever, whatever small role I can play in, in supporting our team in the community and reaching more people and impacting more lives. At the end of the day, like when I look back at whatever impact I had here, that predominantly is like the litmus test for whether or not we're successful. And by the way, I think if we do that well, we can also build, we should be able to build a good business. Mm -hmm. What I really wanted to suss out was investors have sometimes different timelines. The biggest thing, uh, it, it, different priorities. The biggest thing often is the timeline. And I'd say if there is, if, if there are areas where interests diverge, it's on timelines. So mm -hmm. like what I care most about solely, it's the long term. So, so, you know, I hope I can be a part of this for a very long time. And I want to make sure we're making the best possible bet that set us up in the long run to have the biggest possible impact. Sometimes investors have different investment timelines. So traditionally, private equity investors, they're all different, but I'll overgeneralize it. Normally around a five-ish year, seven years, sometimes time horizon. And so we are now four years in, almost four years in to Berkshire's investments. And so sometimes when we think about kind of strategy and the things that we might make investments in, it's not necessarily that the objectives diverge. It's more so maybe that the timelines around certain things and how you sequence them might shift a little bit. That's interesting. I would say one last thing on this, if it's okay. Yeah. I think the perceived divergence and reality are two very different things. 80 to 90% of the time, 
I actually think what actions that we take to reach more people and impact more people and build strengthen affiliates and build great coaches are actually all the things that you would do to build the most valuable company possible. 80 ish. I'm pulling a little bit out of the air, but it's most of the time. There are moments when sometimes how I might sequence things are a little bit different because we've got revenue and earnings goals that we need to hit over a certain period of time. That's so, fair. Let me ask a question about the timeline piece, Don. Like it's my understanding typically, you know, to your point, and we'll overgeneralize a lot of this, but you know, if private equity wants to get their money back within five years and we're at the four year mark. I obviously have not looked at the CrossFit books and have no idea, but I think I have a pretty good sense of where you guys stand. And I can't imagine that we're currently in a position where Berkshire would give, say, okay, it makes sense for us to sell and get our money, right? So with that being the case, what are the levers you think you have to pull as CEO to really drive maximum value to your shareholders? And then obviously, you know, to those of us out in the field, you know, to give us a return back on our investment in the company. Yeah, totally. So the, you're right. We're not where we want or need to be quite yet. So, you know, I shared a little bit before 2022, CrossFit was break even, which, you know, essentially means that we are no profit that year. And so largely when it comes time to, again, grossly oversimplifying things, when it comes time to value a business, often at our stage, one of the things you'll look at is earnings or profits as, as, as a, uh, a way of assessing the value of the business. And so our job oversimplifying things from a pure financial perspective is, is to improve earnings. So take it from break even to something that is healthy. And I've talked about, and I'll be open about this, that the, the target threshold I've set with Berkshire is we need to be in the 20 ish plus percent profit earnings. Sure. That's insanely high. It's not low. That's a place where they'll be able to, if they choose to to exit and, and sell their piece and, and make a nice return against it. It's also, by the way, I'd say, if you look at assessing what is a healthy organization, independent of whether or not you want to sell it, that's where we should be. If you're running a break even business, you know, you're one crisis away from being in real trouble, which I think would be a, a disservice to our community. We have a responsibility to support it. So now what are the things that, that we can do to, again, another gross generalization. If you're looking to improve earnings, there's roughly two ways you can do it. You can grow your way to more earnings or you can cut costs your way to earnings. We have to, we believe when I think about that long-term vision of reaching more people, when I think about the opportunity that exists for us, our opportunity is largely in growing our way to better earnings. And that's about building stronger affiliates. That's about reaching more people. Our price change candidly was part of the strategy, but we, didn't want to make, we're not ready to make that price change until we had confidence that we had built kind of strong momentum, strong retention with affiliates, and that we could make the investments over the course of the next year or two to continue to build on that mission. You'll see other things that we do in and around it. So we're selling t-shirts now for the open. Community loves it. It's awesome. It's a nice way for us to generate some financial return that allows us to work towards those targets. I didn't think you guys got enough credit for the expenses you cut prior to that fee increase for whatever that's worth. Like I, as a banker, I was kind of watching the moves you guys were making for months and, you know, the, the move of the games to Fort Worth and breaking off of masters and teens and adaptive and, and even had layoffs, you know, at, at HQ. And there were, you know, a lot of moves like that were at least from the outside looking in, it seemed like pure expense cuts. And I would, I was saying to my gym partners, we're going to get a fee increase soon because you always cut expenses before you raise revenue. It's a smart move. It's the right way to run a business if you're going to reinvest in the business. And yeah. I was surprised you guys didn't get enough credit for that. Well, you yeah. know, it's, it, look, at, and I think I, I look at things like, well, thank you. And, and you're right. We took, we took a lot of costs out of the business and we're going to continue to take, so if we look at sport, for example, our primary goal this year on sport is one. We want to deliver a great experience for our athletes, for members of the community, for affiliates. We still spend way too much money on sport. We're going to take a meaningful amount of money out of that. That's money that we can reinvest in the long-term drivers of growth, reaching more people, investing in our affiliates. But that is a meaningful focus for us this year. As it relates to the getting credit piece, I, I think there is, look, I, I view that generally, I think our job is to view things through the lens of what can we control and influence. And I think- yeah. Part of our responsibility is doing a better job of having conversations like this 
I don't think they're necessarily things that a lot of businesses talk about, but, but I think part of our job is to educate the community and say, yeah, we are owned by private equity. If you're not familiar with that, which by the way, most humans on the planet are not familiar with how private equity works. Here's how it works. Here's the changes that we're making. Here's why we actually think that's, that's the right thing to do in service of the community. And so that'll be, you know, we're now doing a lot of our communication with our affiliates. And these are the types of things that I want us, I think we're accountable for talking about, because again, those affiliates are our stakeholders. We're accountable to them. I think the narrative around these kinds of decisions is incredibly important because to your point, John, those were really good business decisions. And for the longevity of the brand itself, which I want as a participant in the brand, those types of things need to happen. From a narrative perspective, you know, what do people, what do people online and, and sort of like trying to read between the lines, what do they hear? They hear, oh, my friend was fired. They hear, oh, coverage of the games is going to be shitty because you guys are pulling money out of that. You know what I mean? And those are the same people that, that at the same time are like, hey, what are you doing for my affiliate? Hey, where are you? But they don't, they don't always have the greater landscape understanding of the fact that the, the, you know, finances are flowing through the business and it's all affected and it's all connected. So I, I do feel like being really transparent and talking about it and understanding how people need to digest the narrative is probably half of your battle. And I don't envy you, Don, because you can't make a decision without upsetting half of the community. <laughs> I know, I'm serious. It's like the people who are like, we want CrossFit to grow are the same people who are like, why'd you fire everyone, Don? Like it's you, you know, you know what I mean? And it's, it's tough because it's like, hey man, we're, we have a, a giant big picture view of what we need to do in order to keep this brand around. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I agree. And, and, you know, again, I think for us, you know, a big part of that is, is us really leaning into transparency and communication. And when we make changes, uh, it's on us to show the context around them. And candidly, communicating with our community is not something we've been great at historically. And, you know, if I, if I would partially critique myself in some area, we have not, we did not move quickly enough. And that's on me. There are times when we made decisions that were really good for the community that we did a terrible job of communicating. So it leaves the door open to interpret them whatever way you want. That's on us. I, the team is, we're getting better at that. We've made it a priority. The other thing that I'd say, two, two more things is one, I was sharing with our, you know, our, our team, we were talking a little bit about our overall plan, our leadership team this year. And I think at the end of the day, for a lot of affiliates, we just have to, and, and our community, we have to build trust that they believe that we care about the right things in the long run. And, and I think we, we, we need to show the community that we can build a good business. Not only we, we can, but we have to. And by the way, we can do that and preserve all the things you love about CrossFit, the things that really matter about CrossFit, the things that really change lives. Yeah, that's going to need some change. But our job over time is to, to give you the conviction and confidence. We care about the right things and we're going to get it right. And then the last thing I'd say is like, with something that, that people are as passionate about as CrossFit, we're going to have to do a good job of like, there's just going to be a little bit of this along the way. Like mm -hmm. the change, it's hard. And, and even if you agree with the changes, sometimes the changes themselves are really tough. And I think we have to listen so we don't miss things. So we don't identify the things when we make mistakes, but also we got to have big skin. Because I think it's just kind of part of the journey. Yeah. I think part of what gives me confidence in all of that is just hearing you say par on like on a personal level that you're hoping to be around and steer their ship for a minute. Because I do feel like a little bit of what sometimes makes the confidence waver in the community is this feeling of consistent turnover. Right. And that might not be entirely accurate because at the end of the day, if you really look at people's tenure and the direction of the company, like it's not like we're losing, people aren't dropping like flies. We're not losing people every five minutes in really prominent positions. But there has been a lot in the news over the last For sure. three to four years in terms of high level turnover. And so it is nice to hear you say like, I'm, you know, I want to do the things that set us up for success in the long run because I want to be here for it. Yep. And that's, that's nice to hear from just a, a community perspective, I think. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I, I, I'd say you know, over time, the degree of, you know, kind of coming in the last three, four years to your point, there's been a lot of change. And, and I knew part of my job was figuring out with the team, what were the right changes? We, we knew we had to make some. Over time, that should subside a bit. 
if we do our jobs well. Now, it won't come to zero change. Like any healthy, growing, evolving business that's around or community that's around for a long time has to figure out how to continue to evolve. And you have the natural like comings and goings and, and natural thing. That is just you know, in every environment I've ever experienced, every successful organization, you see that. Part of the trick we have is like when a person on the team leaves, everyone in the community knows about it. So the, the, the amplification, that's not normal at a normal company. Maybe if it's right. no leave through someone else, but like, you know, and, and so that just, I think a lot of folks feel the impact of yeah. might be normal things in, in a way that's more profound than it might be in a, in a different place. Well, it feels like you have, you know, a couple of million employees. That's the way CrossFit feels <laughs> to me. <laughs> totally, you know? totally. That is exactly right. You know, it's it's always felt that way. I've made the joke on this show of the last few weeks that I I feel like a shareholder mm-hmm. because I own an affiliate and because I have relationships with people. It's like I don't own stock in the company, but I feel like I do have a lot of money invested in it and a lot of mm-hmm. personal time. You know, and I think that's where we all get wrapped up in it. We have so much time invested in it, and we all are so passionate about it. We just it it crushes our soul to think it may fail. And and I think in a lot of cases, people that are really passionate about it. It crushes their soul to think it's changing. And so I'd be curious to hear from you this, you you know, I agree with you. CrossFit is changing and it has changed dramatically. And we'll say even the last 10 years, but it's changing a lot currently as as the leader of the organization. How do you build that culture of change in an organization that has been so deeply ingrained for so long? Yeah. So, yeah. And I'd say on top of it, John, as we identified here, You've all got a, a team in a community that over the last three or four years, it's been a revolving door. They feel like they literally just can't get their feet under them. So that the uncertainty associated with that is, is heightened even more. I think for, you know, when it comes down to like, how do we manage that? Well, one, first and foremost, I think we've got to do a really good job of making sure that we as a team do, are making the best, very best possible decisions in service of the community and that we're communicating those well. So. You know, trying to be really rigorous about how do we change in service of what is best for all of our stakeholders for this entire community and impact. So we're not always going to get it right. Obviously, we've made a bunch of mistakes over the course of the last year, but like, let's try to do our best and let's communicate it with within a context where even if the short term changes, you know, we don't always get it right or, or we change something and then we have to change it again, which is going to happen. If we've communicated the long-term, the intent around where we're going and what the destination looks like, it can make it easier for folks to be like, oh, this isn't a massive change in strategy. This is just something we tried that we didn't get it right. We didn't anticipate this or we didn't communicate it well, or it didn't work. And I think we have made some progress there, but we got more work to do. And that's something that every company I've been a part of, you have to repeat the vision and strategy hundreds of times. You know, to the point where it feels like you've said the same thing over and over before folks truly internalized it. We've got that challenge. Plus, we have to do it for millions of people. And so we just got to do a better job. We have to continue to talk about where we're going and why and what matters and what we care about. That's kind of one big piece of it. You know, two, for our team, you know, we're working really hard and we've been working really hard over the course of the last year, year and a half on just just building that strong culture internally where we care about each other. We support each other. You know, there were times in the past where disagreements over certain issues would manifest in, in, let's say, unconstructive team dynamics. And that's natural. Again, it's the same reason it's grounded in the passion that have, have for people. But I, I want us, we're working toward building a culture where like, look, we're going to debate the heck out of stuff. We make fundamentally disagree on it. But once we make the call, we're going to show up as one team and we're going to mm-hmm. say, doesn't matter how you feel about it on the most controversial issues. And I'm really, I think our team, we're getting it. We're seeing the moments where you, you should hear the same thing from every member of our team as we're rolling stuff out. Hard. Super hard. Yeah. It's incredibly yeah. hard. But, you know, what we share with our team, like that's the culture we're, we're building. And so that means backing up your teammate when you disagree. And yeah, you can't get fair. on board with that. Then this isn't the right culture for you. And we've got to be willing to make kind of hard calls in service of that. And again, I, I think our team, and we got to give our, you know, our team, I'll tell you like the impact for the person who has to lead that change, knowing you've got the rest of the team behind you and has your back is massive. 
And so I, I think that's a really critical part of it as well. Yeah, really hard to do on a remote team, which is sure. which is the bulk, the bulk of your team, if I'm not incorrect. We're, we're close to 100% remote. Yeah. Really, really. I, I, I don't envy you for that. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I have... I mean, I have a hundred employees that are remote, but they're, you know, they're all in Cleveland. So I could get my car and go see them. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite the same when you've got one person here in Ohio and you're out, you know, in California, Boulder, or wherever you guys happen to be at the time. Yeah. We're trying to, to, you know, to, to, for, for sure. It's, it's not ideal. I I wish I could wave a magic wand and have our entire team in one building. Can't. So we're, you know, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. We had a, a full team get together in the fall where we brought, the entire company together is incredible. We're doing, so we have our seminar staffs, the folks who are doing our trainings are L1s, L2s. We're doing regional summits now. We're bringing those folks together. And so we're trying to build some of that you know, connective tissue at moments throughout the year. We'll try to use games and other big events to do the same. Very cool. Yeah, you, you mentioned this, you know, culture of, of standing by your peer. And I think one of the things in the past that CrossFit was really known for were kind of the battles CrossFit fought and everyone locking arms around them, right? Like in, in, I hate to call it the early days, but at this point, that's what it feels like was, you know, Greg was battling this CrossFit is dangerous myth with the NSCA and Big Soda, right? That was his, that was his windmill. And I'd be curious, you know, what are those big ticket items for you guys now that you're going after, you know, like, this CrossFit is dangerous piece is still lurking, right? Like, how do you address that as a team like arms? And obviously you're, you know, maybe taking a different approach than Greg did or, or not. I don't know. I guess I'd just be curious how you're addressing it. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, I think there are, there are a couple of things, you know, I would articulate as as perceptions of the brand that, that limit people's inclination to go get CrossFit a shot. So we, you know, I think we all know, right. You're in this community, you know, there are so many people out there who would benefit from CrossFit that hold some perception it's dangerous or I need to get fit first. And and that is a huge thing that we need to influence. And there's, you know, grossly oversimplifying things that you know easy to say, really hard to do. There's two parts of it. One is really making sure we're partnering with our affiliates to make sure that if you walk in the front door, you're going to have an extraordinary experience. And most, the vast majority of our affiliates do an amazing job, but we hear very consistently when we talk to gyms that, Hey, the gym down the street, you know, Right. You know, I talked to an owner this morning who said the gym, you know, member came back and said their warm up was like, Hey, go spend 10 minutes warming up. You know, we'll get started when you come back. So that, that is our responsibility. And that's our owner's responsibility. That's a big piece. How do we make sure that the experience we're delivering on the floor is, is really outstanding things that touch on both those perceptions. It's dangerous and have to be really fit to start. You know, we know. If you're not fit, if you've never touched a barbell in your life, if you're older, walking into a CrossFit gym is extraordinarily intimidating for folks. And if you walk in and your first experience isn't great, you're probably never walking in again. And so that's a big piece of it. The second part, which is largely on us, is around just around the the storytelling in the media that we do to start to shift those perceptions. Our team has been doing a, we've been working more on this lately. I think our team has been doing a really good job. It's just elevating stories, people from all walks of life who can talk about someone who was previously intimidated, who can share their story. That's a, that's a really big, I'd say put that in the bucket of one of the big fights. The second one is one that we're starting to spend more time on, which Greg did an enormous amount of work around, which is, you know, this societal battle of, you know, we look broadly at the state of humanity today and the fact that despite increasing wealth, technological advancement, you know, we are less healthy, less happy, less connected. It is, I think, the existential issue of our time. And we are not, we have not been for the last few years leading the narrative in the way that I think Greg did in, in a really powerful sort of way. So you see other folks who are talking about the benefits of exercise and talking about the benefits of nutrition and talking about the downfalls of, you know, a bad diet, and these bad products. We are going to do, we, we are starting to do more there. We're doing a partnership, actually, the CrossFit for Health is a part of it. We're going to do more there and, and really investing in this. And, and so that's another area you'll see us spend more time on. Well, I have very big feelings about the storytelling <laughs> aspect. Me too. Specifically the media, the media plans behind them. 
Yep. So if you ever want to talk shop about how we're getting those the messages themselves, amazing. How are they actually getting in front of people are the questions that I have. Okay. Awesome. I think I, I love what you guys have done recently around, you know, kind of the older population in CrossFit. That's really, you know, as someone reaching that older population, it's, it's starting to feel more real to me. But, you know, seeing the videos of the, you know, 60, 70, 80 year olds in gyms doing the workouts, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think that reaches a lot of people. And I can't tell you how many people reach out to me and say, how do I talk my 75 year old parent into joining? And I often tell them the same story. And these are the stories I, I love seeing you guys uh, put out. My mom reached out to me a couple of years ago and she had been diagnosed with type two diabetes mm -hmm. and she was super embarrassed about it. And, you know, she'd kind of let her life get away from her. And she went to her doctor and her doctor told her, you're never going to be off medication for the rest of your life. So I had literally just come back from one of Greg's conferences and I had made contact with Karen Thompson, who was at that CrossFit Health Summit yeah. you were just at. And I told her what, you know, what the doctor told my mom and said, can you give me some help? And she turned me on to a bunch of literature and I turned it over to my mom who started doing CrossFit workouts at home because to your point, she was too embarrassed to set foot in an affiliate, but she started moving and she, you know, took up a different diet routine, kind of right in line with what we do within CrossFit. And within six months, she was off the meds, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, it's not rocket science, but it's a great story. You know, and, and, and that's not the only story I hear like that. So I love the fact you guys are starting to delve into that. I hope we just, you know, continue to do more and, and put it out there. Cause I think this is such a segment of, of the world that needs us is that aging population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the uh, ongoing conversation I have with my parents. I and mean, it's true for a lot of folks who, you know, in their, in their seventies and the thought of walking into a CrossFit gym is kind of terrifying. And so. Yeah, that, that is, you could argue that's a point in your life where, where, where you'll feel the most profound benefits in terms of your, what's possible. And so, you know, completely agree with you on that front and, you know, both in the stories and, and then Nikki, to your point, you know, if what you're getting at is, is, you know, distribution, how do we get those stories out there? What are the channels for leveraging? How do we do that? There's, there's definitely more of it that, that we need to do on that front. And there's some things we're doing on that front. Yeah. And I think strategically a lot when it comes to like pitch testing and figuring out how to get different messages in front of different people yep. matters when it comes to who is actually pulling the triggers on those on those decisions. Right. So I don't know if it's 75 year old John's mom who needs to see a meta ad that has herself in it. And then she walks into a CrossFit gym. Does yep. it need to get served to her kids? You know what I mean? And John's a perfect example of that, who then will be like, hey, mom, this is for you. Does it need to be? I mean, there's so many, there are so many different avenues and, and messages. And I think it's important to figure out like how, how are we making the biggest impact for the people who are actually pulling the levers on making those decisions? Yeah. And, and, you know, if you'll allow me just to lean on that a bit, we, I think, you know, often the challenge for us is that there are so many things we can and need to do that often we suffer from a lack of focus. And I would say this is one area where that's been the case for us, right? Who can CrossFit be impactful for? Just about everyone, young, old. Mm -hmm. the, we can't market to all of them at the same time and be effective. No, and so, no, you can't. And we want to, right? Because everyone has a story or a friend that pulls at the heartstrings. And so we have been over the last few months working really hard on, okay, guys, we're going to focus on one goal. That doesn't mean that we don't want the other folks. Of course we do. But like we're going to get a lot more impact if we focus on one audience. And now think about, okay, what are the messages that are going to resonate? How do we reach them through the channels that gets mm -hmm. them where they are? And then let's evaluate it and measure it. Let's test the copy that the, the messages against that audience to see, hey, does the pull. We all know we have this problem of we speak to ourselves. We do a great job of marketing to ourselves. Let's go test it with some folks you don't know across that who have not been yeah. in 10 years. Yeah. There's this trope in marketing that if you speak to everyone, you're speaking to no one. And it's totally true. But it's really hard to sell that in because you're you're speaking to a, a group of zealots effectively. So it's really hard to be like, hey, this like sizzle reel of games athletes that we love that we could watch over and over. And it like makes me sweat because I'm so excited every time I see it. Not the thing that will necessarily drive people to the gym. So it's 
yeah, that's tough. That's really tough. Well, that, that's the big question for me, Don. You've mentioned on several episodes I've seen you on, we have this, you know, kind of stated goal of 30 million CrossFitters and, mm. and, and I love that. And, but my belief is, as I've run the math in my head about a thousand times, as I'm sure you have too, is it's damn near impossible to do through affiliates alone. So you're going to have to do something non-traditional, you know, again, kind of, you know, change is constant mindset in order to get to that number. So, you know, what are some of these non-traditional ways we're thinking about, you know, getting these, you know, either the older population or just maybe people that wouldn't normally be attracted to us to become attracted to us? Yeah, I think there's, it, 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 you know, certainly area we spend a lot of time thinking about, and you're right. If we, if we get to, you know, how do we get to 30 million, a, a big part of that audience will, will not either have access to be able to afford, feel comfortable with training the affiliate. I think our, our conviction and belief is that CrossFit inside a CrossFit affiliate will probably always be the most powerful expression of the experience and most impactful, yeah, but there are a lot of folks around the world who could benefit from it, who won't be able to experience that. And so, you know, with that in mind, it, for us, it informs a couple of things. First, we are focused right now on affiliates. And, and so that will start to evolve or we'll start to think more about the non-affiliate experience. But for now, we think the biggest impact we can have is just getting more people into affiliates where, where we know we've got a model that works extraordinarily well, it benefits our community, et cetera, et cetera. So our focus around growth, our goal this year around growth only count. For, for new members and affiliates. So we have a goal this year around net member growth and affiliates for 2024. Over time, we'll start to, uh, to branch beyond that. And so again, this is reaching, I'd say a non-addressable audience from affiliates. That breaks down a few things that, that we'll have to figure out over time. What is, what's the experience? So how do we create a great, compelling, sticky, impactful CrossFit experience? We have some things we can learn from today. So. We know we have folks today who maybe do a dot com programming at home or a bought programming from third party programming partner. I think there's probably more that we'll need to do to build on that. And so those are folks who are probably the early adopter crowd, highly self motivated. So there's some work we'll have to do to think about okay, how do we create that really compelling experience at home in the garage that drives stickiness, that drive that taps into what makes CrossFit unique. So led it to the methodology leverage the community in a fundamentally different way because you're not there in person and then show that person results over time. And so we're starting to think about what that might look like over time. I think that also sets up, I think there's going to be also probably, actually we have a lot of us today, kind of a hybrid member, or maybe they do two days a week in the affiliate, three days a week. And then for whatever life, travel, et cetera, reasons they do it at home. You can do it today. Is it a, is it a cohesive experience to pulse together? It's not, it, it's pretty fragmented, right? So I think there's an opportunity there as well. The second thing that sets up then once we figure out, okay, what's the experience that's going to be really compelling drive results is how do we reach people? So, so what's the go to market strategy around it? What are the channels that we can leverage to get in front of people? And I think that is probably the easier, if you force me part of the equation. I think the part that's harder is, can we get to the same type of, you know, what I would say in my previous jobs is product work fit around this incredible home experience. If we do that well, a lot of the growth should take care of itself. You know, I, I have a hybrid experience and it's the most expensive one on the planet by owning a gym and then having a home gym as well. But it, but it's kind of the same thing when you think about it. Like I, I work out at home two to three days a week and then I go into the affiliate four days a week. Mm -hmm. And I get the best of both worlds because I can use my affiliate programming at home mm -hmm. and do what everybody else is doing. I just don't have time to drive 45 minutes down to my gym. And then the days I can get there, I'm, I'm with the people I want to be with. I'm with the crowds and the coaches and I get the sense of community. And it's a really good experience for me to have both, you know? And so I love that idea. You know, you should affiliate my garage gym, <laughs> make, make that the new business model. I also hear John, you're trained in seven days a week. I wonder why you're injured. I know. Yeah, it's weird. I know. I'm guilty of that as well. So I can't give you too much of a hard time, but. Ooh, you guys should try my approach of just mm. taking way too many days off and being <laughs> way too tired to approach right. any kind Optimized of Optimized recovery. You're mm -hmm. growing a, you're growing a human, Nikki. I that's think that's, an, that's like daily, daily training. Yes, I'm truly <laughs> smuggling a med ball at this point. It's to be fair, it's six days rough. a week. I do actually take one full rest day a week. For okay, that's good. That's but, good. Yeah, yeah. And um, I do a, 
I, I do try to follow the CrossFit method. I should say that. I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like I don't believe in methodology. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, John. I know. I know. I just let, I just came out of the level one, man. And, you know, they're going, you need to take full, two full days off a week. I'm like, oh, I'm going to fail this test. It was so great. Fun. It was really great. I've been telling, I've, I can't believe how many messages. You guys should make me the spokesperson. I've had so many messages about the online L1. Mm -hmm. Like a hundred at least, at least wow. of, pe of people going, Hey, I've been thinking about doing them, not coaches. They don't necessarily want to coach, but like, Hey, I want to learn more about CrossFit. Should I take this? Oh, amazing. And it, and it really opened my eyes to how many people want more education outside of their kind of day-to-day -day coaching, which I thought was interesting. I, you know, I think the online L1, Don, to be honest, is it's really brilliant in the case that you get. I, I don't, I know you guys don't stack right your seminar staff, but come on, you get Chuck Carswell, you know, you get like, you get the best of the best teaching these classes, which is really cool to get that experience as someone who struggles to, to focus in a real classroom setting, being able to rewind and like, what I hear him say and go back is a really good experience and kind of do it on your own time frame, you know? Mm. Um, and then the webinar was hard as hell. It was so hard. Like. I went, I'm not kidding you. I got up that morning. It was Sunday. I got up, did my normal Sunday training. Every Sunday I do an hour long workout with friends and it's always brutal. It's the worst workout of the week. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't have anything else to do today. I just have that webinar. No big deal. Right. And then I roll in and he's like, all right, grab your PVC pipe and your med ball. And I was wrecked four hours mm -hmm. later, like completely mm -hmm. wrecked from having to do front squats and overhead squats and med ball cleans and deadlift setups. And it was just brutal. Absolutely. And that brutal. has never changed. That's always been the the sort of beauty of the all one over the course of the decades. Well, no and you know, take it in person or webinar. Well, here's the other thing. So I had heard from multiple people had asked me, they're like, well, I don't want to lose the sense of community you get by going in person. And I get that. I made mm -hmm. four or five friends in the webinar that now I kind of DM on a daily basis. Yeah. You cool. know, it just, yeah. it was, it was really, really interesting in that regard. And, and even after you know, a decade of doing CrossFit, I learned so much. Yeah. Like I, I went in going, all right, I'm going to ace this test. And I'll be honest, like 40 out of the 50 questions I aced, but it was 40 out of 50, not 50 out of 50. And mm -hmm. the, the 10, the 10 that I didn't know were hard to sell. And, and so it was, you know, it was, it was a great experience. I would absolutely recommend it to anyone who wants to take it. I'm a little bitter that these people don't have to sweat over a Scantron the way that we did <laughs> like back in the day my first l1 in like 2011 e. was like oh my god if i don't even fill in the bubble all the way i'm gonna get this question wrong <laughs> they're gonna mark me wrong for this right. so we've evolved and i appreciate that well, you don I i'm curious to know like in the i do love the idea of perfecting the at-home experience and opening that up to so many other people who just maybe aren't in the mindset to step into the gym on day one, but we can help them. We can reach them. Are you at all concerned about pushback from the people who are running affiliates who are worried that those are people who, you know, that's business that they could have had in their boxes. And now we're offering them other ways to experience CrossFit without coming in, paying an affiliate membership fee. Yeah. I, you know, it's a, it's a really important Part and, and, and obviously somebody thought a lot about it. And I think it, it really comes back to, for us, one, how we think about philosophically the right CrossFit experience for a member. Mm -hmm. And, and then we're focusing our time, you know, you know right now. We'll, so, so again, I, you know, I talked about a little bit right now. It's, we're kind of all in on the, on the affiliate and get more members in the door. I think as we think about philosophically, our job is to get our members in the the best version of CrossFit that works for their life. The best version of CrossFit is inside an affiliate. I'm pretty confident that will never change. The at home is awesome, but it's not the same. The community's not the same. The coaching is not the same. And we know how impactful and extraordinary those things are. So our job is is to create an experience that elevates people to the highest expression of CrossFit, CrossFit that drives the biggest impact in their life. And if we do that this well, I'm really confident this will be a feeder for affiliates. This might be the most powerful thing we ever do to get people into affiliates if we do our job well. And yeah, there will be an audience of folks who would never be able to experience CrossFit without an online version of it. And those folks that pro are, are folks that probably wouldn't walk into an affiliate anyway. So mm -hmm. just have to strategically execute on that really well. 
and create that type of experience. But if we do, I guess it's going to be a massive win for the affiliate community as well. I'm personally of the belief that CrossFit has been free and available for at-home use since day one. You're 100% and, right. That's it. Like, when, exactly. Dot com is dot com. You, I mean, YouTube videos have been YouTube videos. I've been watching Chad Von Lyft for over a decade at home. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, to me, it's not any different other than truly our culture has shifted and probably most significantly since the pandemic where suddenly everybody and their cousin wanted fitness equipment at home. And those of us who actually really we're going to use it. We're like, what the hell, man? But I do think that it's funny. The expectation in my mind is the same as it always has been, which is if you want to find our methodology and do our programming and kick butt in your garage or living room or wherever, you have always been able to do that. And putting our stamp on it as the brand itself, I think only lends legitimacy to it versus, you know, taking business away from other models. That's just my personal belief. I think that's really, really well framed. I, I, you know, if you look at an extension of that in the course of the past year, I would bet that if you add a dot com plus third party programs that people are using at home, I bet that audience has seen pretty meaningful growth. Mm -hmm. We've also seen really meaningful growth with people on some affiliates. So like, yeah. I think we can reach more people and a lot of the folks who are doing that are ending up inside a gym. So. 100% agree. I think, I think an example of this big win, Don, at my baby sister messaged me. She's not a baby. She's 50. But anyway, she's my baby. She's my baby sister. Yeah, we'll be there. And, Fair. yeah. And she messaged me. She'd been on uh, trying to get in shape and lose her last five pounds. And she's like, I can't do it. I need some help. And so I bought a bunch of gym gear and shipped it to her house. And I signed her up for hard work pays off sweat because mm. I know Matt and Sammy. And I'm like, I, I knew it's what she would need. It's a great program. Yeah. Yeah, and she and she achieved all her goals. But the reason I bring it up is they have a really tight community. You know, the hard work does. And they kind of brought her into that community. And now she loves the messaging back and forth. But she's at the point now, which is probably, you know, 90 to 120 days later, where I bet I could talk her and go into CrossFit Tupelo. Ooh. Because now she's been, now she feels fit enough. That's your market. You know, get them on an app for 90 days. Get them... Oh. You know, through the on the on ramp, the on board where they feel Drink comfortable. The they, yeah, you learn, uh -huh. you meet the community. You know, but it's you know the question is is how do you build that that community aspect? That's right. Uh, of it to make them feel wanted and wanting to be there. You know, it was like she took a photo. The, the only reason I see even on my mind, she took a photo with me when I was home. Next thing I know, I'm getting messages from all the hard work pays off people that I'm in their Slack channel or something. Oh my god, you how know? funny. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, how'd this happen? Like, nobody told me they were taking my picture, you know? But it occurred to me then what a great tight community they have and how important yeah. that is to people to get fitness to stick. You know? For sure. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, look, if, if we learn, like, one of the big, biggest learnings out of COVID is the innate need for human connection. Mm -hmm. Like, this yeah. whole notion of, like, oh, people are going to work out at home forever. Yeah. No. Like, that's fundamentally not the case. Like, the evidence on that is crystal. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a couple more questions left on my list. And I want to be respectful of both of you guys' times because I know you guys have kind of a hard out here in a few minutes. One of the big questions that came up in our conversation with Frank when he was on in a couple of weeks was really around private equity. And, and his contention was, is that they only care about profits. I just kept hearing that come over and over and over. And I work for a company that makes a lot of profit, but it isn't the only thing we care about. Like we, in, we reinvest our money to grow our business so we can reach more people. Now, it's kind of my feeling about what you guys are trying to do. And I know I just threw you a softball question, but, but, but I am curious, like, you know, what are the things you guys are reinvesting this money in and, and, you know, this narrative of Berkshire only wants to take their money. I'm under the impression they're not taking money out right now, but they're I, not. I, I, yeah. I wanted to hear from you, like kind of how this works. They're not. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. Look at, at the end of the day, you know, what Berkshire and most investors care about is, is their ultimate return. And yes, short-term earnings is part of that, but there are other ways of building value for the long-term. So the more people who do CrossFit makes CrossFit a much more valuable entity and organization. And so for us, if all we do, we just take it purely through the financial lens. If all we did this year is optimize for profit, we would massively reduce the strategic value of, of the business for our investors. And so we are, there is some work we're doing there that, that, managing a, 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 an appropriate earnings profile is important for us, but 
increasing the number of people in the community, making sure we have a really strong, healthy affiliate community, building great, great coaches. These are all things that create this strategic flywheel that creates value for the ecosystem. So we're going to spend millions and millions of dollars this year on marketing. So that'll be through, you know, reaching new people, changing perceptions. We, I've talked quite a bit lately around the work we're doing around SEO, search engine optimization. We do a terrible job today of converting someone who goes to Google and searches for CrossFit. We do a terrible job of getting them into a gym. Close to 100% of them should go to a CrossFit gym. If you go search today, you're probably going to see one of our We do an even worse job if you look at someone who searches for, for non-CrossFit specific terms, but maybe strength training. We should own the number one spot of strength training. We have the absolute best methodology and best impact. We, we don't convert us. We're going to spend a lot this year on making sure that experience for folks who are very much in our wheelhouse, who, who want to change their life, getting them into a CrossFit gym. We're doing a bunch of work there. We're doing things in and around kind of health and, and work that we'll do on that front, investment in the brand, investment in kind of building partnerships between. Ultimately, we'd love to do is continue to build partnerships between affiliates and our medical community, right? It, it, the long-term vision is moving the health paradigm upstream to help people with diet and exercise. We can play a massively impactful role in it. These are all things that in the very, very short term will not impact our financials. It's money we're spending to invest in the health and, and growth of the community over time. I love that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it caught me off guard a little bit with the health piece. I was thinking about time. You probably ran into my partner, Tom. Uh, I did. Yeah. We, uh, he did an amazing job. He had, uh, he spoke. It was incredibly moving. Good. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's why I, res- why I was kind of speechless because it resonates with me, you know, because we see this health shift every day in our affiliate of, you know, most of our members are my age or older, you know, and we're just trying to stay healthy for our kids and our families. We're not trying to compete other than hurt ourselves in the open, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And, and it is, it is so impactful to watch someone come in and change their life dramatically. And so I, I love this, this, you know, thought and discussion around, you know, Berkshire not taking their money now so we can build that. That's right. Cause I've, I also believe that's where the value in the brand is. Long term. Yeah, I think so too. I think the intersection of CrossFit and the greater healthcare landscape of our country or of our world it needs to be it needs to have a clearer direction i feel like we have been throwing around the term crossfit health for a while mm-hmm. and i still don't really know what it is it was one thing then it was another thing it was like conferences and then it was like dr l ones and it was kind of like a network but like i still don't know how to find a crossfit doctor it, it, i i would like to i would love for that to grow and I would love for that to be a new linchpin in terms of how we view the brand as a whole. If we're looking at like affiliate stuff versus sports stuff versus health stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, as a, as a community member, I want a good understanding of like how I can get involved in that and how that can impact my life in the future. I think that's a huge yep. avenue for growth for the brand. Well, stay tuned. Yay. Last, last two questions. I'll make it a two-parter. In, in light of all of this. What keeps you up at night when you think of the brand and what's coming up? And then after that, what do you get most excited about? I'd say what keeps me up at night, you know, we, when I spend time with our, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that look at the end of the day, everything we aspire and hope to achieve is, is going to be kind of predicated in us building a, an incredible team that is clear in purpose can execute well together. And, and, and CrossFit is unique, it's challenging, but also the benefit is, yeah, we have kind of have 2 million employees that make our life hard often, mm. but it also means we have people who are willing, willing to invest their time and energy, they do it every single day. And so I think a huge part of our responsibility, my responsibility what's key put tonight is how do we, how do we create the conditions where we can harness every ounce of passion and energy and knowledge and expertise in service of reaching those people. It's super hard when you have a community that big who has different points of view, but, but I wanted to start with HQ. So I want, you know, this culture, our culture to be the best place that folks on our team have ever worked at. I want to make sure they have, they have clarity and direction, leadership they can believe in, a mission that gets them up every day. We've made a lot of progress on this, but we're not done. We have work to do. So that, that keeps me, when I see us 
you know, they, not being sufficiently clear or, or not giving our team the support that they need. That bothers me a lot. Ultimately, that's, that's, you know, what I'm accountable for. The things that get me excited, I went to the health conference this weekend. Mm. I just sat there and listened. I didn't do anything other than listen to Tom and our incredible speakers. And, you know, I just got the chills. I, when you think about, you know, it's all stuff that we know inside the bubble. But if you talk to someone outside the bubble who thinks, oh, CrossFit's a good way to get fit. That's not what CrossFit's about. Yes, it does. But like, we think about this, this opportunity we have, this existential crisis that you really think is like, if there are one thing that, that, that we could solve for humanity, we can have a really big impact. There could be a world 20 years from now where your healthcare journey starts in the gym at where it begins. It's not with your doctor, it's in the gym. And we free up our healthcare community to deal with the really acute shit, to free them up from the lifestyle stuff that is grounded in bad nutrition, that is grounded in a poor level of fitness, that's grounded in social isolation, depression, all these things that we know about. That's what gets me excited. That's what, you know, I think gets the community excited, but it gets our team excited. So it's not going to happen overnight. I think we've got to be like really resolute in our focus. We've got to make the best decisions we can. We got to change horse when we mess it up. And, and, but, but it, there is no organization on the planet, I would argue, that has a bigger opportunity to have a larger impact in, in solving and moving them problem than our, not HQ, but our. So, you know, here's what I hope that our listeners really get out of not just that answer, Don, but like this entire hour that you've given us is I really hope people can hear the passion and the direction for the company as a whole and try to remember that when reconciling some of those more abrasive thoughts of like, well, friggin' they're owned by Berkshire and Berkshire just wants my money. You know what I mean? Or they're probably going to sell tomorrow. Who really cares what we're doing here? Like, I do think that 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 is oftentimes a sentiment that gets amplified or gets resonated in areas where there are really loud voices. And I think that we need to, as a community, give due diligence to listening to all the different angles and all the different perspectives. And yours is particularly important uh, in terms of yeah. <laughs> direction of the company. So I just I do really hope that people hear that and remember that as they as they think about you know, everything as a whole when it comes to the perspective of the brand. Agreed. Thank you for that, Nikki. And thank you guys for the opportunity to talk today. Yeah, I, I would ask you, don't fix all the unforced errors, Don, because they make great memes, man. And it helps. Yeah. That's right. That's a new revenue strategy. <laughs> We're going to keep fueling those. So I got, trust me, I've got an unlimited pool of those. Sweet. Perfect. I love it. Well, Don, thank, I know you're busy. So thank you so much yeah, for the hour. Appreciate you. you spending some time with us. And uh, for everyone listening, thanks for joining. And we will chat with you guys soon.